exchange. And it becomes a very narrow system of production. When you borrow the money from domestic sources, yes, it increases inflation, but it reduces one other tension, which is the risks associated with foreign exchange. It also reduces illicit financial flows. There is still quite a bit of illicit financial flows, outflows from Ethiopia, from the production and export system, from the flowers and, and things like this. But once you start uh, opening it up, for the, every time there's a local political tension, money basically changes hands into foreign exchange and is quickly out. This is the reason why Kenya's economy keeps going back and forth, up and down. So your economy is basically externally beholden and domestic politics becomes a main source of a major disability and a instability, not only in your how you manage that internally, but in relation to managing, protecting the economy from, from the external. Capital becomes short term, what people call portfolio capital. And portfolio capital doesn't necessarily go into real investment. They are money that is made from creating instruments of money. And they are very volatile and often go out. My country faces volatility in that way. Same as Kenya, same as Ethiopia. It becomes impossible to manage your, 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 your exchange rate and inflation. It's a good thing that you are cautious about opening your financial system. Someday you would, in the way that Americans have done, gradual, step by step, step by step. But if you open in flood, give yourself five years and you will see the consequences. There's a second thing that you did, which is that the main backbone of telecommunications is state-owned. This is absolutely crucial because the most costly part of the infrastructure of, of telecommunications is the infrastructure. You, you've given yourself a chance to then build a private sector a telecommunications capability for the last mile so that there is a domestic participation in the telecommunications sector. Kenya is different. Ghana is different. Kenya is basically Vodafone. It's very external. Ghana and Nigeria basically MTN. Government find it very difficult to track their revenues. So you can't even get the taxes that comes out of a heavy state investment in the backbone. Uh, to, last week, I was in a conference about how to apply technology in Addis, how to apply technology for agriculture. And everybody, they brought these technology people from around the world. Everybody is salivating over Ethiopian telecom. <laughs> it's a huge, the potential. They did not contribute to the sweat and blood that took to creating the, the infrastructure. You should participate. You should bring other people to work, participate, work with you, but not replace your own capacity to do the last mile, where the money comes from. It is important to be cautious and to build a domestic economy, an economy based on domestic capability. Mizani was telling me that the road that we travel to to Axum here were built by Ethiopian construction firms. It's very unlikely to find that anywhere in the rest of Africa. That the construction firms will build roads to that level of quality. But construction is the main source of, main means of government procurement. If you procure, if most of your money is procured to an international contractor, how does the money then go around within the internal economy? We've learned some lessons, which are very positive lessons in Ethiopia, as to how you build step by step and bring in and use your own expertise. And you should partner with the rest of the world, but on the basis of the strength of the domestic, the domestic business, business people and domestic investors, domestic innovators. So it is good to be cautious about how and how quickly and you open up the telecommunications system. I think one of the most popular discussions these days across the continent is public-private partnerships. It is believed that 
you can solve, reduce the burden of the state if you bring in the private sector and private investors to co-invest in infrastructure. Well, this is one of the things that some of us work on quite a lot. Actually, there is very little evidence of successful public-private partnership, except, except uh, toll roads. For a toll road, they build it. You pay, you agree how long you know, uh, tolls can be paid to, to pick that up. Everything else, the risks are exceedingly high. Energy systems, you end up, the state absorbing all the risks and getting very little back. For Ethiopia, the main backbone of energy is also almost built, is the last mile. How do you take the electricity to the small scattered rural areas? That's a different framing. And that's not a very commercially attractive proposition for public-private partnerships. It's the backbone that they want. If there are large irrigation and large hydropower dams, especially hydropower dams, where the energy can be sold back to the state and the distributors, where the revenue streams are clear, this is the things that public-private partnerships like because the state will absorb all the risks and they put in some capital, mostly also borrow it domestically, and then the revenue flows start to increase and then they dominate slowly the tariffs for energy. But when the energy that we are looking for, as I said, is small scale, the revenue streams are too small and the risks are too high for, for them to participate. So even irrigation schemes, which is also one of the last mile issues, you have a terrain that doesn't probably favor large, large, large irrigation. There are small watershed management systems, many of them that probably have to feed the small farmers. These are not the kinds of things. And these are the types of uh, agricultural irrigation schemes that build on smallholder farmer productivity. But those are not attractive for public-private partnerships. Again, I think it is important to be more cautious about these things. I think it is important to be cautious about retaining to a philosophy of development that has clearly failed. The financial collapse in the 2007-2008, basically in terms of the debate as to developmental policy that works, neoliberalism has taken a back seat. The only place in which it is this aggressive is Africa and some parts of Latin America. You have something, and that's that or you had something which was beginning to give the rest of Africa some unifying thinking. And that was Melis's thought piece about how you actually integrate development and democracy, what he called the, the, the democratic developmental state concept. It starts with the view that it is impossible to develop without an interventionist state. And that's true. History has shown that. But Simply being interventionist might bring you productivity increases, but can in also create massive internal inequalities. It can create a productive economy by GDP size and GDP growth, but it can also leave millions at the bottom, not progressing. So you can have a vibrant economy set up Kenya, but a large pool of poor people with hardly any pro prospects to progress. And therefore, the way in which you intervene must also have a democratic distribution mechanism in mind. Meaning, the benefits of that progress must be said that it is lifting all boats. Meaning, that lifting is starting from the bottom. And there is always a top bit to combine with it, but largely has to be lifted from the bottom. The economic development process has got to be democratic. But it also has a political dimension which is that ultimately, if people are lifted from the bottom, and if they have more incomes, if they are more educated, in the context of a technologically integrated country and world, they would organize. In a country and a continent where majority are young, and in the next 50 years will continue to be dominantly young, 
that even when you are making progress, that progress will not be fast enough for all young people. But they are educated. They are more urbanized. They are more dynamic. And if they are building their own organizations and institutions from the bottom up, then ultimately, politics at the top has to change. And that is, the democratic process is driven from the bottom up, largely also driven by the economic imperatives and the progress made in the economy. So we cannot talk about democracy and development as if they are separate things. We either have democracy, as Ghana is said, we are a democratic and we are proud of it. No, no, no. We are a two-party state. We are divided down the line by the two parties. We, we hate each other, depending on which party that you have, right down to the family level. It's a democratic process which is driven by money and which divides more than it unites. We can't do long-term planning. As Mizana said, I've been a member of the planning commission. There are 35 member team. It's as if planning doesn't matter. What matters is what a party puts in its manifesto and may make absolutely no reference to systematic planning. And so we are stuck in many respects. It is because that political process is not embedded in an economic process that lifts the bo all boats from the bottom. And so inequalities are increasing. And those inequalities are both vertical and spatial. So a developmental process that is not spatially driven will create spatial inequalities and we will clash at a point in time in the struggle for the state based on spatial inequalities. So there is something about your model which is also good whether whatever the internal debate that you have at the moment is, which is that a lot of those resources must go to those regions, the regions must have autonomy, and must have enough bargaining power to feel to belong to the union. In that process, each one of us have a responsibility to make things work, and yet create our union from the basis of equitable special entities. I like that idea. It is what I tried to borrow and went back to Ghana for five years, trying to get the poorest part of the country going. But it's hard when you don't have a leadership vision that believes in spatial equality, lifting the economy from the bottom, where all the discussions about stock markets and FDI inflows, FDI inflows don't necessarily lead to infrastructure or development. If that's all the discussion, if there's a disbelief in your own institutions to make progress, if the institutions you have are considered backwards and that the only way in which you make progress is to bring in foreigners, you will eventually become a Ghana or a Kenya. I hope you don't get there. In order not to get there, it is important to have self-belief in the progress that you have made. It is an astounding progress. It's almost not comparable to anywhere in the country, in the continent. The reason why people don't know what you have done is partly because the language you don't really do much English, so much of your writing is not English, people can't find what is going on, there's not much interaction, and therefore it's kind of like a closed place. It is difficult to know unless you, you are privileged like me, where uh, the Melizinawe Foundation and, uh, and, and Mizana helps me to go around. But you have made a lot of progress, and you have to start in the belief of that program. That philosophy, almost like a Don Quixote philosophy, actually has delivered results. Don't let it down. Thank you.